Welcome back, welcome back. For 25 years, the small, but often in the headlines, country of East Timor was under the Indonesia. After a long and traumatic road to independence, East Timor became the world's newest nation on May 2002. But six years after independence, East Timor is still holding its breath. Earlier this year, in what the government described as a thwarted coup, the Timorese president, Jose Ramos Horta, was shot and badly wounded. Joining me now from Berlin is the Nobel Peace Prize laureate and president of East Timor, Jose Ramos Horta. How much did the assassination attempt uh, change your life? Well, uh, contrary to uh, many people's fears and my own fears when I was being released from the hospital that I would uh, have a nightmare, well, I haven't had a single one. And uh, I returned to my home. I still object to the much security I'm provided in my country. I still enjoy very much mingling with the common people in the villages. Nothing makes me happier than uh, after a trip to New York or to Berlin or to Paris, uh, going back to my country and going straight into the poor villages, to the barefoot, uh, to people who have little and ask little from us. So I, uh, I remain the same. If anything, of course, I, I appreciate life even more because I was at the borderline of death and life. I saw the darkness of death, and uh, I almost left uh, behind, you know, the beauty of life with all its difficulties, its uh, frustrations, its sadness, its tragedies. Well, there is nothing like be on this planet Earth. Absolutely. How long was the, was the incident? I mean, did you see it coming? Did you see the assassin? I and mean, what what what's your memory of that? Your snapshot of that moment. Well, I have a very distinct uh, memory of it all. Uh, I saw the assassin aiming that powerful uh, automatic rifle on me from a distance of 20 meters. I turned to run, he fired. I was hit by two bullets, two, two fragmentation bullets that explode on uh, impact, and yet uh, none of the fragment, frag fragments uh, affected any of the vital organs. You know, many believers, uh, even doctors, were surprised uh, how lucky I was. Uh, but uh, maybe it was divine intervention uh, made me believe more in that there are supernatural powers that sometimes protect oneself, protect ourselves. Uh, after I was shot, my first concern, uh, I was, didn't panic. For me, it was, I, uh, one of the soldiers ran to me and I asked him to pull out my phone from my pocket about whether anyone else in the house had been uh, wounded, uh, any of my relatives, any of the staff. And I was told no, except the rebel leader that had been shot dead. Uh, I felt sorry for him, but I was even more concerned was that if I were to die, uh, uh, there could be a civil war, and uh, what would happen to the poor people of the country that had suffered already a lot, and if I were to pass away, uh, many of my supporters, uh, which is the entire army, uh, they would go on a rampage and go into any suspect individual involved and would uh, kill them. That was my main concern, that the country would slide into violence again. Because the actual assassin, why did he do it? Would be assassin. Well, no one, uh, yeah, no one understand, because uh, I was the person in the country that uh, would go into the mountains and meet with them. I was the person who opposed uh, the international uh, security forces, Australia, New Zealand, who are there under an agreement with our government and the United Nations to use force to capture them. Because the rebels had written to me saying they want dialogue. And I went on and on engaging them in dialogue with a lot of patience, a lot of 
humility uh, because not many presidents would walk up to the mountains uh, to meet with uh, uh, rebels, with insurgents. I did. For me, people are human beings, and as long as they want a dialogue, we should have a dialogue without preconditions. Let's sit down and talk. So I gained the confidence of these uh, elements, and uh, they even said publicly that I was the only leader in the country they trusted, that I was the only one clean from uh, the crisis of 2006. So uh, the whole country was shocked. Uh, why? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, you remember the assassination of Olof Palm, Prime Minister of Sweden, many years ago, uh, or of uh, Martin Luther King, uh, who is celebrating uh, this year, actually, in April, 40th anniversary of his assassination, or uh, of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. I am not saying this to compare myself with any of these extraordinary people, but uh, it's so irrational. Uh, this kind of actions and unfortunately they were killed those who attacked me uh, they were shot dead uh, my assassin no he surrendered and all his uh, colleagues surrendered soon after uh, i returned from hospital and what would you say i mean it's been your struggle for independence has been so documented for so many years and all the years you spent abroad and the nobel peace prize um, has independence uh, satisfied the people of East Timor, or are they at the moment disappointed with it? Oh, no, I would say that people are happier, particularly after the assassination attempt on me and I survive. When I return, uh, thousands, tens of thousands, actually estimated 50,000 or 100,000 people were there out of a city population of 150,000 not to mention the thousands who uh, came to see me when I went to the villages. And since then, there has not be, been a single violent incident in the country. Even common criminality now is the lowest in our region. According to United Nations own police statistics, all sorts of uh, violence or crime, comparative to Australia, New Zealand, Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Timor-Leste, East Timor has the lowest uh, of crimes, whether sexual assault, whether mugging, whether uh, homicide is the lowest. Economically, we are not doing too bad in spite of the rising food prices. Our economy will grow by 8% this year uh, without counting, including uh, revenues from oil and gas. If we to include revenues from oil and gas, probably the economic growth will be top 19 percent you see people happier you see thousands of people uh, going about to their lives their business more uh, investment on agriculture sector on infrastructures next year so i think we are doing uh, well uh, reasonably well although i must concede situation remains fragile the institutions uh, of the state, particularly army, police, uh, remain fragile, and we have uh, to continue to work on that to ensure uh, that uh, the violence of the past do not occur again. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. President. This has been a real pleasure and a delight, and we look forward to your joining us again soon, perhaps on one occasion when you're in London and so on. Thank you very much indeed. I, I look forward to it. Thank you. Since becoming the first indigenous Bolivian president in 2006, Evo Morales launched a campaign for social change in his country. The nationalization of Bolivia's oil and gas followed. He aligned his country with Venezuela and Cuba, called for land reform, and is seeking approval on a new constitution. With two years left in office, President Morales is now facing one of his biggest challenges to end a violent political crisis in the country. And joining me now to tell us more about what is happening in Bolivia is the Bolivian ambassador to the UK, Beatrice Souveron. What is happening in Bolivia at the moment? Why the violence? Um, you have to understand that what is going on in Bolivia right now, it's a big change. It's a revolution for 700 years. Uh, these indigenous people were born to be ruled. 
not to rule the country. First indigena being ruling the country it makes a lot of changes within the society of my country. And you see, these kind of changes takes time, takes struggle from, of course, the uh, 